Good afternoon. This is Greg Firo, um, Chief of the Genomic Healthcare Branch at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to the third webinar in NHGRI's webinar series. Today we'll be talking about genome-wide association studies, describing the latest on genome-wide association study results and what can they, tell, they can tell us about genomics and health. Today we'll be hearing from Terry Manolio, and after that we'll be taking questions from you. Um, the questions will be taken over the phone, and to access the system, dial star 1 to speak to the operator, and you'll be put in the queue for uh, the questions. It's now our pleasure to welcome Dr. Terry Manolio, Director of the Office of Population Genomics here at the NHGRI. She is currently Senior Advisor to the Director at NHGRI for Population Genomics. She has been involved uh, deeply in large-scale uh, cohort studies, such as the Cardiovascular Health Study and the Framingham Heart Study. She joined the NHGRI in 2005 and le uh, leads efforts in applying genomic technologies to population research, including the Genetic Association Information Network, GAIN, and the Genes and Environment initiative, GEI. Dr. Manolio, I will put your slides up shortly. Super. Thank you. And um, I'm glad that, uh, that everyone was able finally to join. Again, our apologies for the, for the delay. Uh, because we've lost a few minutes, I may skip over a couple of slides. I hope that doesn't, doesn't disturb anyone. Um, and uh, there, there may be someone who's breathing a bit heavily on the phone. If you could just hit your mute, that would be grand. So. Um, Moving on then, if you're seeing my first slide, uh, to talk about uh, these being interesting times for doing genome-wide association studies and really looking at uh, uh, the genome in general. You're probably familiar with Robert Kennedy's uh, quote, may he live in interesting times. Like it or not, we live in interesting times, uh, which, uh, which is actually part of a speech he gave in Cape Town uh, in 1966, well, well worth reading. Uh, there are two other parts to that proverb that uh, I'll just kind of skip over here for the time being. Um, and actually, if one were to look at the, uh, the associations that were known through uh, any kind of uh, really genetic studies, there were maybe six or seven of them prior to 2005. Um, and those were of, there were some question uh, as to, as to how, how strong those were. There were many that had been reported, but these six or seven were sort of uh, pretty solid. But just looking at what has been learned in genome-wide associations since 2005, you, you should be seeing a, a slide that, that shows the entire genome and then on chromosome one at the, at the bottom of it, uh, uh, complement factor H related to age-related macular degeneration, and that was uh, reported in March, I believe, of 2005. And then really nothing much more, oops, uh, nothing more uh, until late in 2006 when there were three more associations, as shown here. In uh, 2007, things started really to pick up, and as time went by, we really have sort of filled out the genome dramatically um, to the point where we're, we're almost uh, near asking people to, to stop working on chromosomes 1 and 6 because there isn't any more room on the, on the graph to show them. Um, but this uh, uh, work has really led um, uh, 2007 to, to be called the year of genome-wide association studies because much of the, of the work really kind of took off in 2007. Uh, this is a, a paper by um, uh, in Science in, in the end of that year. Uh, and just shown here are all of the diseases and traits that have um, published genome-wide association studies done. We keep a, sort of a running catalog of these, and there are, are over 75 of them uh, as of a couple of days ago. So it's really um, going very, very rapidly. Uh, this has been referred to by uh, Hunter and Kraft from Harvard as drinking from the fire hose uh, and, and trying to talk about the um, uh, massive amounts of data that are coming out of these studies. They point out that there have been few, if any, similar bursts of discovery really in the history of medical research, and I think most would, would agree with that in, in terms of the, the number and rapidity with which findings have been reported. So what is a genome-wide association study? Well, it's basically a way for interrogating all of the 10 million variable sites across the genome. So we have 3 billion um, spots in our genome, letters in the, in the uh, spelling of, of our DNA. Uh, and about 10 million of those differ between any two individuals. Um, this variation is inherited in groups or, or blocks. So you don't have to test all 10 million points. You can test maybe a subset of those and, and then infer what the other you know, 9 million or whatever are. Uh, the blocks are shorter, so you have to test more points the less closely the people are related. So when we started doing family studies, they have uh, very close relationships, and so you might only have needed four or 500 markers. But uh, technology now allows us to study unrelated people, um, assuming that there are much shorter base pair lengths in common, so you need many more markers. 
Uh, this is just a stretch of, of DNA on uh, chromosome 7. And as you can see uh, at the top, you know, we're all really pretty similar in 99.9% .9 of, uh, of the genome. Um, but every now and then, there will be one that sort of pops up, like this C uh, over A here, where some people have a C and some have an A up in that upper left-hand corner. And then you go on, everybody's the same for a while, and then there's a C or a T, et cetera. And you have these single nucleotide polymorphisms, about one every 300 bases or so. This is a, a nice figure from a, a review by Christensen and Murray last year uh, that, that basically took an, an example chromosome, just sort of this cartoon up at the top, and then from there took a you know example gene, essentially, uh, in that sort of second um, uh, middle bar uh, that shows various SNPs. Some of them are in exons, which are the red sections of that gene. Some of them are, are in introns, which are the white sections of that gene. There tend to be a few more in the introns than there are in exons, uh, part perhaps because they're better tolerated in introns and exons. And then you see this sort of triangular-shaped diagram toward the bottom. Um, these, these tend to throw people, but really what these are is just the relationship among each of these SNPs, each to each other. And we, it, this is essentially a matrix, and we, we've all been looking at matrices like these for years and years, maybe without realizing it. Uh, when you uh, ask the AAA for a, a, a roadmap and a, a set of, uh, sorry, here's another uh, example of one on chromosome 9, a, a little bit more extended, and we'll come, come back to this one in a second. Uh, but so you ask AAA for a map of the East Coast, and they'll tell you that from driving from Boston to Providence is 59 miles, and from Boston to New York is 210 miles, and Providence to New York is 152 miles, et cetera. Uh, that's the same sort of matrix as we're looking at with these SNPs. And if you wanted to color code these and say that the you know the uh, distances that were really close, less than 100 miles, were dark red, and those that were much further, say more than 400 miles, were white, um, you could do that, and you could sort of overlay those colors on this this matrix here. And if you kind of turned it on its side and made it into squares, you'd basically have the same thing that you're looking at with a linkage uh, diagram. And that's all that we're looking at when you see this dark red between two SNPs. It's just you know if you look at SNP three and four in that diagram, um, that's just very much like Boston to Providence, essentially. Um, so because of this, one tag SNP, or a SNP that, that sort of um, uh, stands up for um, several that it's, that it's strongly related to, can really serve as a proxy for many of them. And shown here is a stretch of, of DNA on, on two chromosomes from, say, one individual, and then the same stretch from another individual's two chromosomes, and then another individual's two chromosomes. Um, and as you can see, uh, you, this, this first SNP here in blue, SNP number three, um, can, can either be a G or a C, depending on which chromosome you're looking at. And SNP4 in gold right next to it actually moves pretty you know, much in concert with it. So when SNP3 is a G, SNP4 is an A. And every time there's a G at SNP3, there's an A at SNP4. And likewise, when SNP3 is a C, there's a G at SNP4. Um, SNP5, on the other hand, in bright green, does not always move together with SNPs 3 and 4. So sometimes when SNP5 is a G, there's an A in SNP4. Sometimes when SNP5 is a G, there's a G in SNP4, and so on. Uh, SNP2, I just take my word for it if you don't want to check them all, but uh, it's, it's also exactly uh, correlated with SNPs 3 and 4, and so is SNP1, again, just in this cartoon. Uh, and these four SNPs could be said to move as a block. So these are, are what are often known as a haplotype block, haplotype just being a string of SNPs of the same, sort of the same flavor um, along uh, one stretch of the genome. Uh, SNP5 has a, a SNP next to it, SNP6, with, with which it is in, in perfect correlation, also called linkage disequilibrium, which is kind of an, an awful name, but it's, so be it, that's what it's called. Um, and then SNP7 in light blue here, and those three form another block. And then there's this SNP sort of in brown on, on the side that, uh, uh, that kind of moves by itself. So if we were to sort of take out the, the SNPs in between here and just focus on the places where people differ uh, uh, between now, between chromosomes, you can see that for block one, you could measure any of these four SNPs and uh, and still get all of the information uh, if you had measured all of them. So, so you might just pick one of them. Um, you could pick the one with the prettiest colors I've done, or you could just probably pick the one that's either cheapest or, or most easy to type. Uh, and you could also pick any one of block two. Um, and then the, the singleton on block three, and you measure three SNPs instead of, you know, probably a thousand or, or ten thousand or so to be able to get all the information that you that you would from all those different SNPs. And this just shows how how these kind of break up into haplotypes, and very often there are just a few haplotypes that are very common, as these top three are, and sometimes then there are others that are, are much rarer. 
So coming up with these um, blocks and the way that the, the SNPs travel together in the genome was the whole purpose of the haplotype map. And the, the HapMap project published its first paper in 2005 um, that uh, summarized over a, a million SNPs, I believe. Uh, and then in, in 2007, there was a follow-up paper uh, that, that reported over 3 million SNPs, and there will be uh, multiple follow-up papers after that as well. The goals of the HapMap were to use just the density of SNPs that you needed to find associations between the SNPs and the diseases, and we'll talk about how one does that, and trying not to miss regions that had disease associations, but to produce a tool that would help in finding uh, genes that affect health and disease, and recognizing that one needs to use SNPs for more complete genome coverage. You need more SNPs, sorry, um, for complete genome coverage of populations, particularly populations of African ancestry, recent African ancestry, since we're all of African ancestry, um, but that's because those populations are older and there's been more time for the relationships between the SNPs to break up, so you, you need to measure more of them. Along with the, the HapMap and probably stimulated by it, um, genotyping technology has improved uh, dramatically and the costs have gone way down. So in 2001, as a slide from my, my colleague Stephen Chanuk shows, uh, we thought we were getting a really good deal if we got a, 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 um, a genotype done by ABI's TACMAN method um, for a cost of about a dollar. You can see the cost along the y-axis there in cents um, per you know, per genotype. And those costs have come down really, you know, almost linearly um, uh, into 2005, as shown here, with various different platforms also typing more and more SNPs. And this, this continued, the slide is, is now two years old, but the, you know, the same trends continue where the costs have just fallen, fallen, and fallen. And the, the numbers of SNPs on the platforms have increased uh, as well. And this has allowed us then to do um, these kinds of studies. So what is it exactly that you test when you're doing this? Well, um, say you have a bunch of people who have, myocardial, who have had a myocardial infarction or heart attack, and a bunch of people who haven't, and you'd like to know how they differ. And in, in traditional epidemiology, you would look at things like uh, their weight or their smoking history or as time went by, their cholesterol levels or their blood pressure, et cetera. Well, one can do the same thing with genetic factors and just ask, you know, is a, a particular gene or, or um, SNP, in this case, RS1333049, as shown at the top here, um, whether the, the different forms of that SNP are associated uh, with, with being a case of myocardial infarction or a control without having myocardial infarction. Um, and as you can see, the C allele of this particular SNP is more common in the cases, 55% of the cases have that SNP compared to only 47% of the controls. So that suggests, oh, sorry, I have that allele rather than that. Uh rather than the controls. Um, so that, that actually one can, can do a statistical test on it called a chi-square test and estimate how likely it is that you would get, um, you would see that extreme value of a chi-square if there was actually absolutely no association and you just saw that by chance. And if this was just due to chance alone, it would be a very unlikely thing to have happen. Uh, it would happen only once in, in 10 to the minus 13th times. So um, much fewer than a billion, billion times would you, would you ever see a result as extreme as, extreme as that. Um, and, and the uh, uh, odds ratio is, is sort of the, the risk associated with that. So people who happen to carry this allele are about 1.38 or times more likely to have a, a heart attack than the people who don't carry this allele, or 38% more likely to, uh, to have a heart attack. Uh, one could also look at, at this by genotype because each of us carries two copies of, of almost every uh, uh, variant in the, in the body except for men who, um, who are, are missing some of those on the X chromosome because they only carry one, one X chromosome. But, uh, but in looking at the, the genotypes uh, for this particular SNP, you can also see that the cases, 31% of the cases have the CC genotype at this SNP compared to only 23% of the controls. Uh, and then uh, looking at the GG genotype, the heterozygotes are about the same, but the GG genotype uh, is much more common in the controls than in the cases. And again, one can calculate a chi-square value and a, and a probability associated with that. And then the heterozygote odds ratio would be what is the, um, um, basically the odds on having disease if you carry one copy of the variant compared to carrying no copies. And uh, that's 1.47. And then for the homozygote, it's 1.90, which means you're nearly twice as likely uh, to have, have disease if you carry two copies than if you don't. 
So see, the, the challenge with these studies is that um, you, you basically are doing this, this same test 100,000 or 500,000 or a million times. Uh, and the, the challenges in interpreting that mass of data are, are what make genome-wide association so interesting. So shown here is the, the very first um, uh, truly genome-wide study, this Klein study that I had mentioned um, in looking at macular degeneration that was published in 2005. And they tested 100,000 SNPs, and they set a level because they were looking at so many SNPs, they said we have to sort of control for the fact that if we just looked at, at you know, things that happened one in 20 times would, you know, would be an, an unusual uh, occurrence, you're going to see an awful lot of those things, and those would be false positives. So one would want to set a, a very sort of stringent level. We'd, we'd only want to see something that might happen by chance one in a million times, or in this case, 4.8 in 10 million times, um, in, in order to, to be concerned that it might actually be an unusual occurrence. Uh, and, and that was that, this where that arrow is uh, on the slide here uh, is chromosome 1, because these are just lined up along uh, from the chromosome, the, the beginning to the, the end of the genome, essentially chromosome 1 to, to the X chromosome. Um, and, uh, and there was a, a very strong association. There's another association that is plotted uh, along with the, you know, basically the height of, of this line here. And you can see uh, around the middle of the plot, um, there's another association that's almost as strong as that one. It turned out that that one was an, a genotyping error. And when they went back and looked at it very carefully, uh, it was uh, it was an decided not to be a true association, and this can be a problem with these studies. You can make these, you know, show these in all kinds of different fancy colors. Here's a, a red one uh, looking at nicotine dependence. And again, the height of the, um, uh, the points here just shows how strong the association is, how unlikely it is to be due to chance, essentially. Uh, this is a nice multicolored one of diabetes. Um, there's, a, there's one in gray here that shows each of the chromosomes sort of separated out for you, and in red, the things that, uh, that really kind of popped out and were strongly related. Um, and here, a, a blue one. Uh, this one has multiple diseases, so this was a, a very extensive study of seven different uh, common diseases, and they showed all of their associations in one plot. They like to call it the, the 10 million pound plot, but at any rate, uh, there's one, one where they're sort of falling from the sky. Uh, this one was done over Christmas time, and they, that was sort of what they had on their mind. Um, but if one looks a, a little more closely at one of these associations, and this is one, again, that I mentioned previously for myocardial infarction, you can see that in blue here, there's an area that shows really very strong association all the way up to 10 to the minus 14th. So 1 in 10 to the 14th chance that this could have happened by, by chance alone. Um, and that was that, uh, that SNP that I showed you before. One can take this area on chromosome 9 and sort of stretch it out, and, and that, that's it, this area here that I'm just highlighting. Um, and if you sort of stretch it out, this is the same region, and it's now just looking at chromosome 9 and just focusing on the, on the blue dots. So the red dots were a, a replication uh, sample, but, but this was the, uh, the finding that was reported by these authors, and it's in chromosome 9. And then one can look again at our old friends, the red triangles, um, and looking for how the SNPs that are, have been tested in this particular study are related to each other. Do they travel together or don't they? And as you can see from that middle panel where you remember the, the really dark things were the Boston to Providence ones. So those are ones that travel very closely together. Um, and there are a, a number in the, say, the left-hand side of this uh, uh, ellipse, or maybe a, um, a 10 of them or so that are kind of clumped in that region. And they seem to be in this group of triangles uh, that's labeled one, in this triangle it's labeled one which is one kind of linkage block, a block that moves together. Um, so, so those are, are probably, you know, among those you might not need to test all of them, although these authors did. Um, but the, there are other places in, in the, within this ellipse that are not in that linkage block, and so you'd want to test uh, those other areas as well. And sometimes these linkage plots can tell you a lot about what might be the causative gene. So in this plot, looking at uh, inflammatory bowel disease, in the middle you can see, again, these association statistics. And you see there's sort of a mountain of them in, around the 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 12th um, uh, p-value, uh, minus log 10 p-value level, right over the, the um, x-axis that says 674. 000, 000, 000. Um, and, uh, and in this region, there are actually three genes. You can see that there's, sorry, there's um, uh, this IL-12-RB2, the IL-23-R, and a hypothetical protein. And all three of these might be possibilities as being related to this disease. But if one looks at the, at the linkage patterns, you can see that these darker triangles, now just shown in black and gray here, there are really only about two blocks that are, are strongly associated with the disease. And those pretty much narrow you in to looking at this interleukin-23 uh, receptor. So that's how those can, can sort of help point the way to a, a particular disease that might be caused, uh, a particular gene that might be causing the disease.
uh, unique aspects of these studies. They really allow examination of inherited variability at an unprecedented level of resolution. And they allow you to look at the genome really without having prior hypotheses, because we know so little about how the genome functions. It's, it's, in some ways, it may be better just to say, let's set aside all our previous notions and, and just look and see what we find. And, and it's amazing what we have found, uh, for example. Um, oh, and, and as another uh, um, sort of positive to this, that once you measure the genome in this way, you can really relate it to any trait that is uh, consistent with the informed consent that's been provided by participants. So interestingly, most of the really strong associations that have been replicated a lot in these kinds of studies have not been with genes that anyone would have suspected of being associated with the disease in question. So they weren't really on anybody's list of, of things that probably would be associated, and so they would have been missed in, in prior studies where you had to rely on a, past, on a prior hypothesis. Um, and some associations have been in regions that weren't even known to, to harbor genes, and, and no one's quite sure what that means, and that's a, an area of very active research right now. Um, but as, as Hunter and Kraft point out, the chief strength of this approach is also its chief problem, because when you make more than 500,000 comparisons per study, the potential for false positives is, is really unprecedented. I'm a big Gary Larson fan. This is a, a God Collings. I hate to start a Monday with a case like this, uh, um, an annual Butlers of the World banquet with a knife sticking out of one of the Butlers. And God knows who all these, you know, false positives there are there along with the uh, the possible um, true positive. And so um, something that's, that's been recognized for a long time in genetic studies is that false positives are, are really quite possible even before we had genome-wide association studies. And this sort of now classic review by uh, uh, Joel Hirshhorn pointed out the large number of uh, genetic genetic associations uh, that had been reported uh, with diseases, and you can see that climbing really dramatically after about 1994. But in looking at the 600 or so studies um, that, that uh, he reviewed there, really only six of the associations were significant in a, in a consistent way in more than three quarters of the, of the studies he looked at, and these are the six that are shown, that are shown here. So this was not a very good record. Um, it was really something that was quite concerning to people. Uh, we did much of the same thing in atherosclerosis, but I won't uh, go over this due to time. Uh, and this led to calls among editors and, and journals and publishers for replication, uh, that, that probably the most important way to, to be sure that an association was real was to d demonstrate that it had been replicated elsewhere. There weren't really good criteria for what constituted replication, so there was a lot of um, discussion about that. And we ended up having a workshop here with our colleagues at the Cancer Institute to come up with a, a series of, uh, of criteria, essentially, for what truly is replication and, and what the criteria for it should be. And we always, we all, uh, I think, agree that replication is probably the, the three most important things in, uh, in, in confirming a genome-wide association. Um, but it was important that the initial study be described in sufficient detail so that you could even try to replicate it, because you needed to know where the cases and controls came from so you could have similar kinds of cases and controls. You needed to know things about participation rates and how they, they were selected into the study and how affected status or case status was defined, and a number of other things uh, as shown here. And then in the replication study, you wanted to be sure that a similar population, if not exactly the same population, had, had been used, that the phenotype was very similar, so they weren't studying height in one study and weight in another, but, but really using uh, much the same phenotype, and that they used the same uh, sort of inheritance model, the same SNP, the same direction, uh, and that they were adequately powered to detect the, the uh, possible effects. So the sample size was large enough, really, to, to be able to detect effect if it truly was there. Uh, strategy for doing this was described by Bob Hoover, again, at the Cancer Institute, uh, suggesting that, that one approach, and this has been taken by many of these studies, um, is to begin with, say, a, a reasonably large sample, 1,150 cases and 1,150 controls with a large number of, of tag SNPs, 500,000 or more, and then a replication study uh, that might be even larger than that, that but that, that would only test a, a subset of those, maybe 5% of those that were associated. Um, and then a second replication study, uh, again, of large size. Uh, that tested even, an even smaller number that replicated in multiple studies. And then getting down, you know, sort of at the bottom of this funnel to even a smaller number and, and hopefully coming out at the end with maybe 25 to 50 loci, uh, in this case for prostate cancer. And this is very much what was done in prostate cancer and, and led, I think it's, it's only been about five or, or six loci for prostate cancer, but there have been other diseases in which more loci have been found. 
Uh, and this was a, the approach that was used in breast cancer. Uh, in, uh, Easton et al. published this in, in 2007. And they used a much smaller um, uh, initial set of cases and controls uh, and a, a moderate number of SNPs, 267,000, uh, but then a tenfold greater size uh, for the replication sample that tested 13,000 SNPs, um, then 24,000 cases and 24,000 controls to test uh, 30 SNPs, and then uh, sort of came ended up with uh, with six at the end of that study. Um, and this, this involved over 50,000. Uh, women with and without breast cancer, and, and these are all of the cohorts that were um, studied and able to, to uh, enable this finding to be uh, come up with. So, so these are really big, big collaborations. They're real challenges to put together. Uh, you can also have problems with false negatives. So uh, here, and now Edgar's gone, something's going on around here, even when the false negatives might be really pretty obvious. Um, and this was uh, the, the prostate cancer study I referred to previously with 1,100 cases, 1,100 controls, uh, then dropping down to, uh, then increasing, sorry, to 4,000 cases and 4,000 controls with uh, their top 27,000 SNPs um, selected at this particular p-value. Uh, and what was interesting about this, when they, they tested um, uh, the two stages together, uh, there were four SNPs that were really very strongly associated from the p-value here, this MSMB, um, uh, the SNP in MSMB associated 7 times 10 to the minus 13th and, and so on. But when that was just looked at in, in stage one, uh, the initial rank was actually number 24,223. So its p-value was not very impressive at all. It was really way down in the, in the ranking. Um, and similarly, even this uh, the second SNP that, that ended up at 2 times 10 to the minus 9th was only the 2400th SNP or so uh, with p-value that would have not have knocked it off, knocked anybody's socks off. So, um, so there is a, is a challenge in being sure that your replication sample is large enough, not only to to pick up the false positives, but not to miss any kind of false negatives. Uh, it's been a real challenge trying to keep up with this literature. Uh, the number of published reports has increased nearly exponentially. Uh, there were 191 as of September, at the end of September of 2008. And at the Genome Institute, we're trying to keep track of these through what we call the Catalog of Genome-Wide Association Studies, which is available uh, on our website. If you can't remember the, the URL, if you just Google GWAS Catalog, it should come up as the, as the first hit. And what we uh, have tried to do here is to give a comprehensive listing of all of the um, uh, published genome-wide association studies, including information on the, the author, the, the date, the journal, the, the trait that's being studied, the sample sizes, uh, both initial and replication, uh, the region of the, of the genome, whether it's on chromosome 22 or chromosome 3, um, the gene that has been implicated, the strongest SNP and the risk allele uh, that, that have been suggested to be associated, and the frequencies of those p-values, as you can see here, uh, from the catalog. So a fair amount of effort to pull out all of this and really the objectives were to identify and track all of these publications, extract key information about the associations, and make this widely available as a scientific resource for the community. Uh, and it includes a downloadable data file. So if people want to get on and download this into an Excel file and use it for other research, uh, they, they are welcome to do that. Um, we see commonalities across associations, genome-wide rather than disease by disease. And I'll show you some of the, the things that, that we can draw, you know, conclusions we can draw about these, uh, these SNPs. And we want to describe the approach clearly so that others can replicate or expand on it, and we can maintain consistency in the approach. Um, and we pull these out basically from um, uh, published uh, databases and, and various electronic uh, clipping services that we have of news, and as I described, what uh, um, kinds of information we pull off previously. Um, and we're looking here at, at about 180 published papers, um, excluding a few of them that didn't report the specific SNP. There were 145 uh, reports involving uh, nearly 800 unique SNPs, um, and then there were about 3,800 that were perfectly linked to them. Um, so they also uh, would carry some important information. Um, so about 4,600 SNPs total. Uh, 80 th 83 of the SNPs in these reports had been reported two to seven times, um, some of them in, in association with traits that we would really have thought were, were necessarily related to each other. Uh, just giving some examples of, of those, sorry, um, before that. Um, functional classifications of these, uh, these index SNPs, um, whether they were in regions of, the, of a gene or of the genome that might be coding for proteins, and if they code for proteins, do they lead to a missense change, so a change in the structure of that protein. Um, there were only 37 of these 782, or only about 4% of those, that were in, this, in those particular regions, even though those were the things that everybody sort of thought for sure are, are what are going to be causative of disease. Um, there were 11 or about 2% of, of them that were in the coding region and, and made a change, but they really didn't change the protein that was coded for. 
340 that were in Tronic, and then a, a number, a smaller number in, in various other parts that might be uh, related to regulation of gene expression. And then a, a good 350 of them, um, more than 45%, that were intergenic, that really weren't in, in any genes at all, uh, and again, are, are stimulating a lot of research as to why, why that is. I'll just I'll skip over this one, I think. Uh, the odds ratios, or the, the um, uh, basically the, the probability, essentially the risk, of having disease in people who carry one of these variants compared to those who don't carry the variants, are, are typically fairly small. As you can see, most of them tend to cluster around the 1.2 to 1.4 range. And, and half of these associations, so the median is 1.28, so half of them are actually less than an odds ratio of 1.28, half or, or more, obviously. Um, and uh, this is very similar to what's been seen in, in Crohn's disease and, and uh, the, the same kinds of, of distributions of, of uh, variants explained or, or odds associated with disease, uh, roughly the same, the same idea. And what's shown in this dotted line is the power to detect these risk loci. So probably there are many more that have even smaller odds ratios, but they're very difficult to detect unless you have massive sample sizes. So that may be why they're not being seen. Uh, and there are some that have very large odds ratios. Those may be of some interest and something that would be worth um, uh, looking into in, in more detail. Uh, I'm going to skip through these because this is, it's kind of a pretty picture, but uh, I'm just showing you here uh, what some of the uh, very high uh, odds ratios, uh, strong odds ratios, have been associated with and the allele frequency of those associations. And these are shown in, in a little more detail here uh, with these the various diseases um, uh, that all have odds ratios greater than about four and a half fold. And uh, those might be um, genes that, that would be of, of great importance on a public health basis, but again, need to be looked at in, in much more detail. Um, we've also looked at differences across populations as to, as to how different the frequencies are in, in people of, say, European ancestry or Asian ancestry or recent African ancestry. And for the most part, they're really pretty similar. And again, just focus on the, the light blue uh, here, but the pink is pretty similar as well. Um, and for the most part, the, you know, more than half of these are, are under a, a, a genetic distance, which is a calculation of how different they are in populations of less than 0.7. Uh, but there are a few that are, are, uh, have much greater variability across populations than that. And those might be uh, of some interest as well. And in fact, in looking at them, many of them are traits uh, for um, both Im immune, uh, uh, traits related to immunity and traits related to pigmentation, uh, which we know are, are highly differentiated across populations. Um, so just looking here at the, um, the top 5% of, of F FST values, so those that are 0.49 or greater, which is a, a pretty extreme difference among populations. Uh, in the blue, those uh, tend to cluster among immune-related traits, pigment traits, obesity traits and then some neurological and height findings in that. Uh, and in the top 1%, so the really extreme ones, uh, really pretty much focused in, in immunity and, and pigmentation, um, which are, are, again, probably things that are, are quite uh, um, distinct by geographic origin and, and allow you to survive in the particular environment that you find yourself. Um, some interesting findings that have been in, in uh, um, genes that were not previously expected to be related to disease. I already mentioned the macular degeneration finding in complement factor H. Uh, macular degeneration was thought to be a degenerative disease or, or maybe an ischemic disease related to blood flow, but no one really thought it was related to inflammation, and yet uh, this gene shows up very, very strongly. Uh, some others in coronary disease, asthma, type 2 diabetes, really weren't on anybody's candidate gene list. Um, gene deserts, areas where there really aren't any genes at all, have been very strong associations with prostate cancer with the tip of chromosome 8, and there don't seem to be any genes for 500,000 megabases or, or more. Um, so, so what does that mean in terms of, uh, of causation of disease? Uh, Crohn's disease similarly in various areas without a lot of genes. Uh, and interestingly, um, some of these associations have been in common with diseases that really weren't thought to be related to each other. So even though diabetes and coronary disease can be risk factors, uh, diabetes particularly a risk factor for coronary disease, uh, even when you control for, for that, there seems to be this, this association with two otherwise quite different diseases. Uh, and melanoma, I think, don't think anybody would have, have expected uh, that to share uh, pathogenesis with coronary disease or diabetes. Uh, Crohn's disease wasn't thought to be um, all that related to childhood asthma, and yet they share this association. Is this real? Is it replicable? It seems to be. Um, what does it mean for disease pathogenesis? We don't know, and that's something that's uh, an area of active research. Um, and multiple cancers related to this prostate cancer signal uh, and other um, signals in common in multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes, again, perhaps pointing a, a way to um, common, sort of a common etiology of these diseases. 
uh, something that, that may um, leap out at you is that Crohn's disease shows up a lot here. And in fact, one of the lessons I've learned from this is if you want to find genes for common diseases, you should study Crohn's disease because uh, here are all these you know, more than 30 associations that have been reported for this more than any other disease. So I think uh, I'll, I'll wind up here and just note that um, nearly half of the SNPs that have been identified in genome-wide association studies as being related to common diseases are intergenic, so we don't know what genes uh, they're, they're related to, and, and we need to find that out. Uh, only about 8% of, of index SNPs, or the SNPs that are identified in these studies, are encoding regions or regulatory regions of the, of the genome. So um, again, uh, needing to look at, at intergenic and intronic SNPs. Um, we recognize there is some bias in genotype SNPs for an excess of missense variance. That's one of the slides I skipped over, but it's essentially some bias on the platform for what uh, kinds of SNPs they're looking for. Most of the odds ratios are, are really pretty small, well less than 1.5. And risk allele frequencies don't appear skewed either toward rare alleles or toward um, variants that, that vary a great deal between populations as, as uh, indicated by large FST values. Um, but the, the, few, the small number of SNPs that do seem to be highly differentiated across populations seem to be enriched for, for uh, traits such as these. Um, and looking at low side extremes of these characteristics might, might really teach us a, a lot about uh, things we don't know about the genome. So I think I'll, I'll end with a quote from Sir Tim Rice in, in AIDA, the more we find, the more we see, the more we come to learn, the more we explore, the more we shall return. And we, we certainly have a lot to return to in the, in the genome. And Greg, I think I'll stop there and be happy to take some questions. Great. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Dr. Manolio, this was a really excellent uh, presentation, amazingly uh, fascinating uh, results. Um, I would like to um, um, now open the uh, line uh, for questions from the audience. Diane, I think we're uh, ready. Uh, to reach the questions, uh, you need to dial star one. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one. Please unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question. To withdraw your request, press star 2. One moment, please, while we wait for the first question. Lanny Ross, your line is now open. So uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. My question is, given all of the association with Crohn's disease and given the high frequency of Crohn's disease in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, how are we assuring that we're not actually seeing that type of founder effect and that we're really getting it over diverse populations? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And uh, many of these associations were initially found in, in Ashkenazi Jewish um, uh, populations, but they have been extended to populations that, that, don't, that are not of that descent, and, and we're seeing exactly the same associations. Excellent. While we're waiting, I, I actually have a, a question for you. Um, given the large number of associations with Crohn's, um, it's a little curious to me, um, how, how frequently does ulcerative colitis show up on that? And I think clinicians think of those as sort of related, perhaps, sure. disorders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there may be about half of the low side that are, are seen in Crohn's disease are also seen in inflammatory, well, in, in ulcerative colitis and, or inflammatory bowel disease in, in general. Uh, and the reasons for that are not entirely clear um, because they are, they can be difficult to distinguish uh, both clinically and, and um, uh, histopathologically, but there are, you know, clearly some, some syndromic differences between them. So it looks like about half of them are shared. Now, whether that's a, a power issue that we, we just don't have enough cases to be able to detect them or not uh, is not entirely clear. Diane, other questions from the audience? A question came in from Sharon Jones. Your line is now open. Uh, hi, um, I'm Siobhan Jones with HumanGeneticsDisorders.com. I wanted to know um, in what ways can I incorporate this into genetics education awareness for the general public? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's reasonable at this point to, to say that, that this research is, is ongoing and it's, it's really has exploded in the past couple of years and this is what um, many geneticists are very, very excited about. That, you know, we've, we've been looking and looking and looking with, with various tools um, and, and really hadn't found a lot that, that held up in lots of other studies, but, but this really has. Unfortunately, at this point, there's much more to be learned about this than there is to be taught about it, as it were, um, in, in that, we're, you know, every Every answer we get raises 
20 questions that we don't have good answers for yet. Um, so the, the fact that these associations are generally pretty darn small um, suggests that these aren't going to be useful really very soon for predicting disease. They may be very useful in identifying um, treatments or pathways that, that might uh, uh, suggest approaches either to prevention or, or treatment. Uh, but I think for the, for the moment, if we can convey the excitement of, of being able to find parts of the genome that everybody thought were silent, was, were silent and that, that really didn't do anything, uh, we sort of arrogantly used to refer to junk DNA and, and that. Um, well, these junk DNA areas are, are associated with disease and, and in a very, you know, uh, sort of replicatable, duplicatable way uh, in ways that we don't understand. And, and, you know, it's a real challenge, I think, to, to all of us and a, and a reason to get young people into, into science um, is, is to try to figure out these associations. Okay, go. Cool. Next question comes from Becky McLean. Your line is now open. Yes, thank you. Do you have any ideas of why your associations are more frequently found in uh, immunopigment and obesity-related diseases? Um, well, actually, the, the ones that I was showing you there were the ones that differed dramatically between populations. So between um, populations of recent African ancestry versus European ancestry or Asian ancestry populations. And we, we suspect that, I mean, we know that, that pigmentation varies dramatically by geography, and, and there seem to be, you know, sort of plausible reasons for why that would be. And, and so, so that, in a way, kind of reinforces the fact that, yes, this makes sense. Um, the immune-related ones may, may be a little bit um, more obscure, but probably, and in fact, we, we do know that there are, are some pathogens and bacteria in that that only live in certain climates or uh, other, you know, factors related to environment or soil or plants or allergies or whatever uh, that are only available in certain climates. And so, so it, when those climates or geographic areas are, are acting on a, on a subpopulation over tens of thousands of years, we evolve to sort of respond to, to that in those environments. Environmental stimuli, so so that would probably be why those are differentiated as well. The the obesity ones I can't really explain, or the the neurology ones, those again are, are sort of question marks we have to pursue. If you have any more questions or comments, again please press star one. Again, please press star one. While we're waiting for other questions uh, to uh, come in, I'd like to draw your attention to the slide that I failed to put up at the beginning of the webinar. Um, this is an additional email that you can use to uh, reach uh, 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 Laura Rodriguez regarding uh, data sharing policies for genome-wide association studies. Diane, any further questions coming in? I show no questions at this time. Fair enough. Well. Um, I would like to thank all of you for participating in this webinar. Um, we've enjoyed hearing your questions. Uh, our next webinar will be held in two months on Thursday, January the 8th at 1 o'clock, I think, uh, Eastern Time. I think it will be a very interesting topic. The long and short of it, finding genes for complex traits in the domestic dog. I have heard this talk before, and it is quite interesting. Um, so um, I will um, leave you with the fact that you'll be receiving more information about this uh, upcoming webinar as the time draws closer. Again, thank you all for attending.